In this lecture, we will introduce the concept of Poincher brackets. But before we do that, we would like to talk about representation spaces. Representation spaces are nothing but a geometric description of the problem in hand. I mean, like a dynamical system, we represent it by a set of uh, independent coordinates. Now, of course, the minimal description is the configuration space where in generalized coordinates which describe the system are used to denote the state of the system. So, that means the system at any given time in that n dimensional space is represented by a point, and with time, this point moves in the n dimensional space. As a simple example, it is considered a pendulum which is uh, oscillating with very small amplitude. So, it is uh, undergoing a motion like a simple harmonic oscillator. And if we consider theta to be the generalized coordinate, then uh, the generalized coordinate uh, has, uh, we have only one generalized coordinate. So, it essentially moves along this axis the dot represents the system and it is doing an oscillatory motion. So, in 1D system, it just stays confined on the axis. We extend, we can extend configuration space to event space by adding time as yet another dimension. If we do that, then the harmonic oscillator uh, uh, is represented by a sinusoid and the system at any given time is on this sinusoid and it moves along the sinusoid as a function of time. But at any given time and for a given q, uh, there is no restriction by the system, by the design of the problem this is that uh, what should be the q dot. The q dot is only fixed by uh, initial condition, but by the description of the system alone, a q dot has no restriction and it is almost independent. So, this independence of generalized velocity or rather more conveniently generalized momenta, that gives us the concept of phase space, which is 2 n dimensional with n generalized coordinates and n generalized momenta. So, our pendulum, which was doing uh, which is doing simple harmonic motion for that it is a 1D system so we need only Q and P. A phase space trajectory for that would be uh, an ellipse That's simply because the Hamiltonian which is constant is quadratic in P and Q with a different coefficient in general. So, as such uh, ellipse describes the phase space trajectory of the simple harmonic oscillator of that pendulum. If the pendulum moves with larger amplitude, uh, then of course, uh, it is not simple harmonic motion anymore, but yet it will be a largely a uh, closed orbit in the sense that is, it is a oscillatory motion Q and P they will still give us the uh, trajectory which is uh, confined. But other motions are possible. Say for example, the pendulum can have such large velocity that it does not oscillate, it rotates about, it keeps on rotating about the point of support. So, in such cases, Q is not bounded, Q is going uh, on and it will increase as a function of time. So, Q being the angle, the angle keeps increasing as it rotates again and again. Of course, I mean, uh, the momentum is oscillatory in the sense when it goes to the highest position, the pendulum has minimum velocity and when it is at the lowest position, the pendulum has maximum velocity. So, this is the lowest position with highest momentum and this is the highest point with the lowest momentum and uh, it keeps on oscillating. 
So all such trajectories is possible and phase space trajectory could be quite interesting. If we add time as a dimension to phase space, what we get is state space. This is the most general description where we have n generalized coordinate, n generalized momentum and time. So that same harmonic oscillator, the pendulum with a small amplitude, in this case will follow a helical trajectory. The projection of this helix on PQ plane would be an ellipse, but otherwise as a function of time, the particle will follow this uh, uh, this orange color trajectory, it will move up from the PQ plane or down, but it will essentially follow a helical trajectory. Now, when we say that we are working with Hamiltonian and Hamiltonian dynamics, we are actually describing the system in state space as opposed to the Lagrangian dynamics which describes everything in the event space. So, we now define the Poisson packet. Let us suppose we have a dynamical quantity which is a function of the generalized coordinate, generalized momentum and time. Now, by dynamical quantity, I mean any function of this q, p and t. So, for example, Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian itself is a dynamical quantity. Or it could be just product of q and p. It could be uh, angular momentum. It could be a component of angular momentum or a component of linear momentum. So, in general, any function of q, p, t, we consider that to be a dynamical variable or dynamical quantity. We are interested in the total time derivative of the dynamical quantity. How does it change with time? Now, uh, that is extremely easy. Uh, first, we write down df dt using the chain rule. So, we have del f del qj, qj dot plus del f del pj, pj dot plus del f del t. Uh, remember, we always have this sum over j. We are using Einstein summation convention, so we are not explicitly writing down uh, the summation sign, but it is there. Okay. But we have from Hamilton's equation of motion that qj dot is del h del pj and pj dot is minus del h del qj. So, as such, we replace this partial derivatives at the places of qj dot and pj dot in this equation to get something like the total rate of change of this dynamical quantity now has the structure, the product of two partial derivatives, one of f, the other, uh, other is Hamiltonian, with respect to qj and pj. From there, uh, we subtract the similar partial derivative, but now the pj and qj, the order is uh, different. So, it is del f del pj times del h del q. We define this to be the Poisson bracket. We write it as f and h. I put some curly brackets around them. And we also use this subscript q and p to indicate that uh, this operation must be done with this small q and small p. Now, uh, this, is the, this is simply definition. This is how we define it and we will look at the properties of Poisson bracket shortly. So, by using this definition, we can say the total rate of change of f is the Poisson bracket of f with h plus the explicit time derivative of f. So, if, if f hat is a, an explicit function of time, then uh, we take the partial derivative with respect to time. So, we found the definition of the Poisson bracket to be 
this f and g, the partial bracket of f and g with respect to q and p is the partial derivatives with respect to q's and p's and then in opposite order and with this uh, negative sign. I remind you again that there is a sum over j. So this is not a single term, there are n terms right, because we have n generalized coordinates. Now, uh, there are some fundamental points of brackets. For example, when we have this f is q, qi, i is generalized coordinate and g is uh, qj, j is generalized coordinate. Then qi, qj, their partial bracket is del qi, del qk. So, uh, we just replace the dummy index from j to k because uh, we are already using i and j. So, sum is over k in both the terms. If we do that, look at this first term, del qi, del qk. This is clearly a Kronecker delta i k. So, this Kronecker delta is 1 when i is equal to k and it is 0 when i not equal to k. So, obviously, uh, the generalized coordinates being independent of each other, uh, it follows. And del qj, del pk, I mean qj and pk are independent quantities, so there is a derivative vanishes. Similarly, the first partial derivative of the second term also vanish. And net result is uh, then this partial bracket vanishes. So that means qi and qj, their partial bracket is 0. So partial bracket of two generalized coordinates is 0. Uh, exactly the same way we would be able to show the partial bracket between two generalized momenta pi and pj. That too vanishes. That is 0. An interesting result is when f is qi and g is pj. So that means we are looking at partial bracket between qi and pj. We use this definition and the first term del qi del qk that gives us Kronecker delta ik and the second term del pj del pk that gives us Kronecker delta jk. And I remember the sum over k is there. The other partial derivatives like partial derivative of q with respect to p or partial derivative of p with respect to q vanishes. So, this delta i k times delta j k, the two Kronecker delta where we have the sum over k, uh, that simply gives us delta i j. So, you see q i p j that gives you 1 when i is equal to j. Otherwise, it is 0. So, partial bracket between a generalized coordinate and a generalized momentum, it will be 1 if the generalized momentum corresponds to that generalized coordinate, same generalized coordinate. So, then it is 1. And if they are different, then they are 0. Meaning, uh, suppose the generalized coordinate is x, then x and px, their partial bracket would be 1, but then x and py or y and px, their partial bracket would be 0. That is the uh, meaning of this particular result.